Well, again, as I was saying, we are excited to have Brother Dave Reaver in service with, with us this morning. He and his beautiful wife, Beth, who this is the first time she's been able to join us. Uh, they were just married around this time last year, wasn't it, or thereabouts? And Janet and I were privileged to be able to uh, go up to the Dallas area and attend that wedding, and uh, we're just excited for them. But I tell you, I don't know, as I said, I don't know anyone who gets more done uh, than Dave Reaver. He is, uh, he, he, I don't have the energy that he's got. And uh, as a matter of fact, he, they've been in Vietnam for incredible things going on in Vietnam. They've been there for uh, almost two weeks, and they just flow, flew in from Vietnam at midnight last night to be with us here today. And uh, that's, just, uh, that's just the kind of energy he's got. And it is such a privilege to have them with us this morning. One of my dear friends, he, he made it possible for Jesse and I to go on the Colorado motorcycle ride a couple weeks ago because he had his guys bring a trailer down here uh, for us to take our trikes up there. I don't think I could have ridden the thing up there, ridden around Colorado and ridden back, although that's what he did. It just shames me, I'll tell you. My rear end couldn't take another day of it but somehow he's able to do it. And, uh, but anyway, what an honor and a privilege. Uh, Brother Dave's been coming here to CT Church for uh, many years, and uh, we always counted a privilege that he takes out time out of his schedule to be here with us. So let's welcome Brother Dave Reaver this morning as he comes. Thank you, Pastor. You're my hero. You are my hero. I love you, sir. Never had a better friend. This is, this is truly an honor for me to be able to be here today and say how much I love your pastor and his beautiful wife, Janet. I'm going to sit down if you don't mind. I don't stand well. I'm 2010. I broke my back in Iraq and I haven't been able to walk right since. They put in 12 screws and two rods, and I'm an inch taller. <laughs> However that works. But i got to tell you, I've never been around a man like your, your pastor. Other than the fact he fell off his track three times, I thought he did good on that trip. <laughs> <laughs> we covered some miles and had a... A wonderful time. Jesse, are you in the house? Jesse, are you there? I can't see if it lights your eyes, but I want you to know, Jesse, you are, you're an example. You're an example of honor, respect that's due to the man of God, the prophet that was among you, and he, uh, he was just beyond wonderful. Love you, Jesse. Hey, I got married in a fever. Down, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want you to meet my wife. Would you welcome Dr. Beth Ann? Baby, would you speak to her? Okay. It's a blessing for us to be here. Thank you. It is so great to do praise and worship with you. Um, we're enjoying this moment today. Thank you for what you uh, bring to us, and we hope that we can bring something to you in return. Now, Pastor Matt, you mentioned the word Olympics. Okay, <laughs> here it goes. <laughs> I didn't enter the Olympics, but I did enter a marathon at the age of 52, my very first marathon. I don't know how I was going to do it, but, you know, I'm one of these people who take a challenge and do anything that's put before them. But in this particular marathon, I entered this because, let me take a step back. Um, my late husband was a U-2 pilot in the Air Force. Uh, he flew on a mission over in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, he did not return. However, his mission was successful. So at 
the reason why I entered this marathon is because they had the medal. And on that medal was the U-2 spy plane. So when I saw that, I took that opportunity. It was a challenge for me. I'm going to do it. No matter what, I'm going to do it. So I took the challenge, signed up for it, went to the day of the race. Actually, the day before, I ran the 5K before the day of the marathon. And I got a little medal with the U2 spy plane on it. And I thought, wow, this is pretty fun. I'm ready for the marathon now. So the next morning I get up and I'm in the race and I started the race and we're 13 miles into the race now. And I'm like, hey, we're going pretty good. This is all right. And you know what? I didn't even train for this race. What was I thinking? I didn't even have sneakers on. <laughs> I was getting blisters, and I was losing my toenails when I tried training for this marathon, and I said, I can't do this anymore. So when I went to the running store, I turned around, and I saw this rack of flip-flops. Not these, but pretty similar. And so I decided, well, this is my only opportunity if I'm going to go in this race, because i got to get that medal. That's all I could focus on was the medal. And so I went to, um, bought the flip-flops, went to the race, 13-mile mark. I'm just trudging along, and I'm like, this is pretty good. 13 miles, no training. I'm good. I'm good to go. 16-mile mark comes around, and I'm like, oh, I'm starting to feel it a little bit, but I'm still okay. I can do this. 19-mile mark comes along. What crazy person does a marathon without training and in flip-flops. <laughs> so uh, the 21-mile mark comes by, and I just, I just hit a wall. Now, mind you, when you train for a marathon, you also carb load that day so that your body can sustain uh, and persevere through all this whatever you're putting on your body. It's tough, okay? How many of you have been in a marathon here? Nobody? One. We got one person. A couple people. All right. So you know what I'm talking about, right? You need to train and you need to carb load. And I didn't do either one of those. I just took the challenge. So 21-mile mark comes by. I hit a wall, and I'm like, I cannot move anymore. My legs, they're, they're just beat up, my knees are tired, um, I'm drained, and I had sunscreen on my face that was seeping into my eyes, I'm crying, and I'm like, I can't do this anymore, I can't do this anymore, and I was ready to give up, I was ready to give up that medal, and all of a sudden this young guy comes along, he's like, oh God, help me, <laughs> I gotta get through this, and I'm like, hey, why didn't I think about that? Okay, God, help me. <laughs> so, you know, when you stop, that's the wrong thing to do because now it's going to take more energy to get going again on these wobbly legs, right? So I finally got the momentum back up again, and I was just, like, moving along slowly. And then I see this elderly lady, much older than me, just blowing past me, and I'm like, Oh, no, this is not happening. <laughs> so, and she's from my town. And uh, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't let that happen. So, <laughs> so I decided this is my opportunity to finish the race. I did. And I couldn't, didn't have any control over my body when I finished the race because there was that guy standing there handing out all the medals as he crossed the finish line. I couldn't even finish the line, cross the finish line correctly. I plowed right into the guy with the medal. <laughs> Had no control over myself. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the good news is that I finished the race, and there I am, flip-flops, no lying. So I want to liken this to 1 Corinthians 9.24. Run, uh, 
Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. In that race, it was the prize was that medal because my focus was on that medal. But in our everyday life, our prize is God. And that's who we're running for every day. So when you're in the discipleship training, compare that to the athlete, where the athlete, there's only one winner in a race. In the discipleship training, everybody wins because we're all running for the calling of God on our lives. So I just want to share this to you so that way you know that you have the power of Christ in you. He is with you wherever you go, and he gives us the power to maintain our lives and our lifestyle, and he guides us, and he protects us, and he is there with us all the way. Let me end this. Do not do what I did. Okay? <laughs> but Dave is a good example of running in the race for the prize. He has such a calling on his life, and here he is. He's still here today, and he is still running in that race for that prize. Such an upward calling of God on his life. Thank you, Dave. I love you, Doc. <laughs> Wish I'd been there to see her run into that guy trying to give me her, her medal. That's a picture. Wow. That's, it's a great story, Ben. Um, I, I want you to know that endurance is not always easy. Uh, it's not always. In fact, endurance to the end sometimes makes you wonder, is it worth it? You ever, you ever been there where you wonder, was, was, it, was it really worth it? Uh, I'm going to get her to help me right quick. I'm going to get this out of the way because I want to I get these things mentioned. And then I want to spend some serious time. With you. I think I'm getting a bad feedback up here. If you can help me pull back some of the, the – there you go. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to do this quickly, and I want you to know why we're doing it. First of all, I want to preface it by telling you I don't take any – I don't take any uh, – I don't take any, uh, What's it called? Royalties. I don't take royalties for these books. We wrote them, and I did bring my library. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. I, I brought the library. Uh, a lot of you have these books, but I want you to know why I'm mentioning them today in particular. Uh, I'm, we go from here to the border of the United States of America and Mexico. I've been called in by the UN, United States Border Patrol to minister to the agents by the thousands, and I'm doing it. I'm doing that. So I do this for our military. I'm a contractor with the Department of Defense, and uh, I travel. Right, right now we go to Hawaii. It sounds like, oh, that's great. Let's go to Hawaii. That's a lot of work. It's when you work out of Pearl Harbor with the U.S. Special Warfare Command. And I'm trying to give hope to people that are being asked to give their lives for a country that, for a government that does not appreciate them. The country appreciates them. The government doesn't. And I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. I really don't give a rip. Right now, if any government, I don't care who they are, if they don't show respect for our military and our border patrol, I'm not going to show respect for them, flat out, period. And uh, uh, so today, when you buy a book, you're buying a literal audio book that goes into that patrol car. And while they're sitting there by the hours, they hear something that's encouraging instead of tearing them down on the news. It builds up their spirit instead of destroying their spirit. It gives them hope instead of blaming them for everything they're not doing right. And I hope that you understand when you purchase these materials, it is 100% for others, not for me. Everybody understand that? Say amen. amen. That's why you can use your credit card or your friend's credit card. <laughs> the one you found in the driveway. Use it for kingdom of God. No, I'm kidding. Uh, let's do this real quick. Uh, baby. Forged in Fire was a book I released last time I was here. That's what they're getting in particular. It has a companion book. It's called Consuming Fire. And the companion book is a, it extracts out in a devotional the best of the best out of Forged in Fire, which is the story of a family that learned resiliency through suffering. 
and my family took a lot of hits, not so much from what I went through, but what I put them through. Trying to find my way in a world that was so dark. And these two books are available to you. When you buy them, you're buying one for the, for the Border Patrol that will be delivered this week. And then a book called uh, War and Recovery, which is a book that it can be read as a devotional short story from the battlefield of Iraq and Afghanistan to the mission field of the world. You'll find that every story in there has a scripture that backs it and applies it to the civilian world just as fluently as it does to the military. You don't have to go to war to get hurt. I wore a Purple Heart pin today. Why? Because I want to be able to illustrate to you and say, I went to war, got hurt, got a Purple Heart. You go to divorce court, get hurt, and you get a broken heart and a broken war shirt. And the dryer gets to go to the ex and it worked. <laughs> Life's not fair, is it? Come on, you know I'm telling you the truth. This book, help, this book will help you deal with that. Another one called Scarred. Most of you have that book, but it's an autobiography. It shows the work I do today with the Department of Defense all over the world. And it is from childhood. You can track how God kept his hand on a little boy's life for a reason. My life is no more valuable, no, important, no more important, no more loved by God than your life. Don't let this podium, don't let this mic, don't let this platform fool you. You are just as important to God as I am. Do you understand that? Say amen. So today, a lot of things I'm going to be sharing are going to make that equal ground at the cross. Another book called Magic Fountain, Story of Three Old Hags. Some of you have got it. If you hadn't, you're going to miss one of the funniest and best stories you'll ever read. It's not like a children's book, but it's an adult material. I don't mean adult as in triple X. I'm talking about it will go from not first grade to, to the grave. I'm serious. You will be stunned at the story. It's about three old hags and their search for riches and what they ask for when they get to the end of the road. And what's funny is when you find out which one of the three hags you are, it's really funny. It's really funny. You'll love it. And then lastly, we brought the flag for the Border Patrol and the U.S. military with a thin green line. We also have one for, uh, for our first responders in law enforcement and place them with a thin blue and thin red line. These flags need to be flown to show your support for those who are willing to give their lives for our freedom. Amen. Amen. Let's pick one up back there, if you don't mind. Beth, thank you, darling, for your help. I think she's a good speaker. What do you think? She's going to do it. <laughs> good, good job, Beth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a few statements today that I hope you'll pay close attention to. I didn't come here today because I was scheduled here today. I came here today because I'm on a divine appointment. Let me, let me rephrase it in some way that maybe will make more sense to you. I can go anywhere I want to. I can be anywhere I want to, speak to any crowd I want to, just about. <clears throat> I've got invitations all over. None of that's arrogant. I'm trying to make a point. There was an earthquake in Japan. I was supposed to, we were supposed to come back from Vietnam through Japan. Every flight in and out of Japan was canceled. That meant I wasn't going to be here. I said, I'm not, that's not acceptable. When you're on the back side of the world speaking a language that's as different from any language on earth, and you cannot control your future, your destiny, it's out of your control. The next 48 hours were completely out of my control. Beth and I were so amazed at how easy the enemy can throw a wrench into your plans. Do you hear, did you hear what I just said? He's good. He's really good at that. I looked at my... My, my director of our foreign missions over there, I said, Dan, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to miss Sunday morning at Calvary Temple. I'm not going to miss it. I'm on the back side of the world, but I, I'm not going to miss it. I made a commitment to be there. God has a reason for me to be there. We have a word from the Lord, and we will be at Calvary Temple Sunday morning no matter what. And that's a big statement. We're on the other side of the world, and the country you're going through to come home is the most traveled country in the world to go to Vietnam. Every decision we made was instantaneously thwarted, had to be changed, reevaluated. We came home through the Middle East. We came th home through Doha. I've been to Doha many times. I've been through every country in the Middle East many times, but never through the commercial airports. I'm always through the military arrival and departures. That's a little bit different, less comfortable. But instead of having a nice seat in the 787 or whatever, you're sitting in the back of a netted seat in a C-130 cargo plane. 
Oh, Lord, I like the seat a lot better we had. But we got in this morning. Actually, it was 1.30 this morning when I laid my head down in that bed. I said, baby, it's 1.30. Five minutes before my alarm went off telling me to get up and go to church, I woke up refreshed and ready for today because God's got something he wants to tell you. And uh, to do that, listen to me, to be obedient, it's not always categorically explicable. That is to say, you cannot always count on having what you're going to do and say written down for you. I'm not bringing one note to this podium because I'm not going to speak from notes. And something came to my mind as I was sitting there watching your hero, my hero, Pastor Doug. I saw him crawl on off that motorcycle. I saw him ride. He had me laughing so hard I fell off my bike. I have never enjoyed your pastor more in my lifetime. We've been buddies all of our lives, it seems like. See, we have headsets that have radios, and they're on all the time. If you sneeze, you hear the, you hear the guy sneeze. Five or six of us had radios. We heard everybody sneeze. We, you know what I heard from your pastor all the time? The entire time we are on those bikes going all through those beautiful mountains, he's singing. He's singing in my ear. I'm hearing him sing. And I think, man. What, it's wonderful, praise songs followed by, I love rock and roll, put another dime in the jukebox, baby, I love rock and roll. You never know what you're going to hear from Pastor Doug. And then he said, you know, when I'm riding on my trike, I look over and I see a cow, I move. I said, you what? He said, I move. And that cow looks up and says, look, there's a cow on a motorcycle. <laughs> and then the cow says, how can a cow afford a motorcycle? <laughs> That's your pastor. I feel so sorry for you. I wrote that down. I will never forget that. When I see a cow, I'm, <laughs> you know what I thought about? He lost a leg. It isn't what he lost. It's what he would give to get it back that makes value. You know what? He, he'd gladly give his home away if he'd get his leg back. He'd give every car he's ever owned away if it would give him his leg back. I've thought about this for myself many times. If I could just have a day that a child didn't look at me weird and hide behind mama's skirt. And it's better now that I have a nose. And it's cute, isn't it? It's a boy. <laughs> I got eyelids. I got lips. I, I've lost, but... I'm still the more easily functional than your pastor will ever be again in this life without some kind of divine creative miracle. There's so much that he would give away to get that leg back, but there's one thing I can promise you. He'd never give Janet away for that leg. I don't Janet. You've been good to him lately? Okay, then you're safe. He, he, he wouldn't give that leg away for his children. He, there's nothing he'd give away to get that back that's of greatest value. You know why? There's an answer to that. I, I, before I give you that answer, I'm going to take this down another lane with the same conclusion. They did a movie in my life called Scars That Heal, done by Worldwide Picture, sponsored by Dr. Billy Graham and his ministry. In that, there's a depiction of me at a time in my life when I was dealing with what is valuable and what's not. I've, I've reduced it to a simple question over the years. Is anything worth dying for? If there's nothing worth dying for, is there then anything worth living for? If there's nothing greater than the sum total of Dave Reaver, I'm not worth dying for. I'm not. But there is something greater than Dave Reaver, and that is you, and that's everything else of God's creation is greater than me because I put myself very low on the total pole. See, whenever... I looked in the mirror the first time and I saw that I had no face, just this piece of a face over here. Everything else was gone. 
first thought I had was if I could just take my life, this would stop right here, right now. And I tried to. I tried to take my life. I actually was in Japan when I asked for the mirror, and they, I was wrong to ask. They were wrong to bring it. I looked up, and I saw with my good eye, I could see this side was swollen the width of my shoulder. This side was all charcoal. You could break it off. They broke my nose off, my ear off, what was left of it. It didn't blow off. It was a little piece of it. I heard them snap it off, and my eyelid, they, they literally tore it loose and threw it in the garbage. I heard it hit the garbage can. I looked in that mirror, and I saw that. I couldn't let anybody see. I couldn't let my wife see me. I couldn't let my parents. I couldn't let. I could not let anybody see me. And I took it out of God's hands. I took it out of my doctor's hands. And in my own hands, master my own destiny, I decided I would do it my way. I did it my way. One of the sorriest songs ever written for the human race. If you ever listen to the words, you'll see how blasphemy it is. Listen to all the words and you'll see. I did it my way. My way would have ended in death if there wasn't intervention. I didn't have a gun or knife, so I just pulled this long tube out. And I, I figured, hey, let me tell you something. Once you open that door of suicide of the devil, it's a hard one to close. In fact, most of my lifetime, I fought with it. And I want you to understand something. When, when you do it your way, you're master of your own destiny. And when you're master of your own destiny, God is not the master of your destiny. When he's not the master of your destiny, you're a self-made man. The problem with a self-made man, he worships himself. He worships his creator himself. And the self-made man is not good enough God to be God over who you are. Only God, your creator. You didn't create yourself. I didn't create me. I created a lot of chaos. I created a lot of problems. You create your own chaos and problems. But we, don't, we can't blame God for that. Why me, God? He said, I didn't do it. You did it to yourself. We drink ourselves, smoke ourselves, eat ourselves to death, and then blame God. Y'all still love me? Am I safe, Pastor? Listen to me. Why me, God, doesn't fly with him? What if he answered you, I don't know, George, or something about you I don't like? Poof. God doesn't do evil. God didn't make me sick. God didn't shoot me. God didn't set me on fire. But I became master of my own day. It isn't what happened to me. It's how I deal with it. There's a thousand ways to get hurt, but there's only one way to be healed. You know that way is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the healer of the brokenhearted. He came to heal the brokenhearted. Do you agree with that? Say amen. amen. Then that's a good premise to start with. So let's get back to the question at hand. What is the most valuable thing in your life to you? Is it strong enough, good enough, wonderful enough, amazing enough, joyful enough to counterbalance, counteract all the difficulties you face in your life? And can you forgive yourself? Can we forgive others for what for sinning against us? We forgive God for sinning against us. God doesn't sin. Ask yourself that question next time your child dies from sudden infant death syndrome. When your child is killed in an automobile accident, tell me God doesn't sin against us. See, he doesn't. We know that. But when you're in the middle of the battle, it's God's fault. So if it's God, why me? God's saying, God, you did it, so you sinned against me. How do you forgive God? You substitute the word sin for trust. God, I trust you. You don't sin against us. But you know more than we do. You're ahead of the game. You're ahead of the curve. You're master of my destiny, not master of my own destiny. It's going to get a little more personal here in a minute. I would never have asked for what happened to me. Pastor Doug would never ask what happened to him to be done to him. It doesn't matter how it happened. What matters is what happened and how we deal with it. I'm not going to go through life the rest of my life shaking my fist in God's face, asking the stupidest question. Why me, God? Why not me? Who am I to think I'm better than anybody else? Who are you to think you're better than anybody else? Something happened to you, well, it's just not fair. Let me tell you something. Life isn't fair. The day you think it is fair is the day it just got the best to you because the worst of you is still here for us to deal with. You see, we take life one day at a time. That leap of faith isn't for the end of the road. It's for the next step. And so on July the 26th or 
a horrific day. Pastor woke up and he told me, don't go to the hospital. You wake up, they take your leg away from you. <laughs> you don't know tomorrow any better than I do. Moaning and complaining about it's not going to make it better. It's going to make it worse. I guarantee you, I absolutely vow to you, I promise you. You cannot complain enough to make tomorrow better. You'll only make it worse. And so, whenever you're in the middle of the fray, how do you handle it? I don't handle it well. I'm not, not going to sit up here and pretend I'm something I'm not, Mr. Holy. You think I'm perfect? What world did you come from? You think because of the mic, the platform, the podium, you think this makes perfection? You know why the priests had to ask for their own forgiveness before they asked for forgiveness for the, for the sins of the nation? Because if they didn't ask for their own forgiveness, God would have killed them. Why do you think they wore a bell and a palm granite around the hem of their garden when they, uh, garment when they went into the Holy of Holies? And they wore a rope around their waist, and one end was tied to them, the other end was tied to the deacon board. <laughs> he went behind the veil, because if they heard those palm granites and the weight of it suddenly hit the floor and all those bells rang, he said, well, another one bites the dust. They, they can't go in there, because if they go in there, they drop dead. They're sinning their life. He hadn't had a chance to ask God to forgive them for it. So they dragged his dead body out, and with his dead carcass, they have evidence, we got to find us another preacher. And now how would you like to come up on this platform with a rope tied around your waist? See, I take seriously standing at this, sitting at this podium. I take it dead serious. There's nothing in my entire life I take more serious than to know that the words of my mouth can determine your eternal destiny. It scares the crap out of me, pardon the language. I take it so serious, I'd rather lose my life than have an audience go to hell because of me. I have to seek forgiveness too. The vulnerability of ministry is difficult. Because I'm not going to be a hypocrite to you. I mean, what kind of hypocrite can I be? I'm going to look like something I'm not. I mean, am I going to put on a good face? I don't like going to Japan because people over there don't like you to lose face. Mine was blown off. <laughs> losing face doesn't, it's not called, called, called losing hand or losing feet. Losing face means that countenance, that image that you're trying to project. You lose it through the dishonesty and disgrace of hypocrisy. And when we're hypocrites, we have lost face, not only in the presence of God, but between ourselves, but worse yet, between me and that mirror I'm looking at. I will not live a life that's a sham. I have to seek forgiveness for myself. I'm not going behind the Holy of Holies and ask God to overlook my sin while I ask God to overlook yours. If I'm not willing to be honest before God, I don't have the right to be at this podium today. See, the thing about suffering is it's a great reducer. It knocks off all the top edges. Elon Musk came up with a little, a little device you can plug into your wall. It cuts about 20% of your electric bill down. I don't know if you knew this. The, the electric companies don't want you to know this. I bought one. It works. You plug it into your wall anywhere, but preferably, if you can, near the, near the electrical box. I put it in my, in my ministry center. I put it in my home because I'm going to save money, right? It's a good deal. Plug it in. The light comes on. You know what he does? He takes the average through that little box, and those spikes that cost you as though it were spiked all the time, those spikes, it cuts the top off of them, levels it, and brings that electric bill down. Through a, just a little box, he invented for an old woman that wrote him and said, how can I get my electric bill down? And one of the brightest men in the world decided how to do it, and now it's available at Walmart. Some of you didn't know. I'm not here to sell it. I ought to. I'll put it on my table. <laughs> Make a pretty good salesman for it. See, if we can get the spikes down, if we can get an ad, if, if we can somehow find a mellow space with God without all the spikes of reaction, be proactive, not reactive. And I don't know how to do that very good. 
Spontaneous utterances. You know what I'm talking about? That spontaneity, just saying what comes to mind. I'm not good at it. Well, I'm good at that, but I'm not good at controlling it. I, uh, I remember the time I pulled up behind a guy at a red light. On the bumper, it said, honk if you love Jesus. So I honked. He shot me the finger. <laughs> and then I saw his head go down. He just realized he's in his wife's car. <laughs> he took off and I followed him. The light was still red. We both almost got hit. It's those instant reactions. How do you control the flesh? How do you control it? I wish I knew how. To constantly and never again have those spikes. But I can tell you there's a little, little thing you can plug into your life that can help. It's the Word of God. That's why I'm doing those little, those little sound, what do you call them, thumb, thumb drive? I, I, I'm not good at thumb drives. It's like I told this little boy once, don't suck your thumb. He looked at me, and that was the end of that, buddy. <laughs> they made what I have of a thumb. They made it for my hip, so I said to the next kid, don't suck your hip. <laughs> he looked at me like I lost my mind. See, we learn through the things we suffer. And not always is the lesson for us. Sometimes we suffer to give other people a lesson. Jesus didn't suffer because of his own sin. If he died for his own sin, we're going to hell without a hope of any kind. He died for our sin, amen? So if he died for his sin, we're, but he gave himself for us, at the cross, then rose from the dead and gave himself to us. He was with us, now he's in us. Let me make that very clear to you. He didn't go through what he went through for his sake. He did it for our sake. Suffering is the great reducer to reality. Does that mean I'm going to sit here and say, let's all stand in front of a city bus and get run over so we got a testimony? No. I got more testimony than I ever wanted to start with. In fact, I worry about more testimony. I've had people say to me, wow, Dave, you speak to presidents, you've addressed the kings of the islands of the earth, you've spoken to shape the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Powers of Europe, you speak for NATO, you speak for the military. I'm listing some highlights intentionally, not bragging. You're about to get the reducer in here. You'd do it again, wouldn't you, Dave? I look at them and I say, wow. Imagine that. A grenade blows six inches from my head, and you got the brain damage. <laughs> you think I'd do it again? Are you out of your ever-loving mind? If you have a mind left to be ever-loving? I wouldn't have done it the first time if I know it's going to hurt this bad. But see, I didn't know. And I don't know now what I didn't know then. I don't know tomorrow. Looking back, oh, we do everything different looking back. Yeah, I'm smart, buddy. I figured it out. I'm on my own now. My own... I'm my own God, self-made man, figured it out. And yet you cannot tell me 10 minutes from now what's going to happen in this room. If you don't believe me, ask the people in New Braunfels when that guy walked in with a gun and started killing people. You don't know tomorrow. I don't know tomorrow. But I know who holds tomorrow. So it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It's how we deal with it. How we, did we learn anything? What's, and if we don't learn through suffering... We miss one of the greatest examples of Jesus who learned obedience through the things he suffered. Well, suffering's got to be the consequence of sin in your life. Well, where did Jesus sin to suffer for? See, he didn't suffer for his own sin. He suffered for our sin. There are other people that make mistakes that I suffer for. I've gone into public schools, and before I even got my foot through the principal door's office, the door to the principal's office, he's telling me what I can't do. You can't this, you can't that, you can't somebody, you can't, you can't, you can't. Don't tell me what I can't do because somebody else screwed it up. Somebody else is saying, I'm not going to pay for somebody else. You pay for other people's sin every day of your life. There are thousands, millions, probably several billion laws written in every language of every tongue, of every religion, of every custom on earth. Because somebody sinned and you're paying the consequence of it. Sin has its payday. There was an old guy on television, on I guess TV, but radio for sure. His name might come to me in a minute. Baptist preacher. 
He had a ministry that was so cutting, and yet it was so true. Payday Sunday. My dad had a message he preached when I was a boy. In the Latin, it's called Letalionis, the law of retribution. The Bible calls it, you reap what you sow. So you sow to the wind, you reap, not the wind, you reap the whirlwind. So what do we learn from what we have experienced? One thing I learned, don't play with matches. <laughs> Especially those big ones that have a pin you pull and the handle on it, you throw it. See, whenever we go through things in life that we want to blame God for, the question shouldn't be, why me, God? The question be, should be, what am I going to learn out of this? What do I take home out of this? What do I get? You know what I'm learning? I'm learning at 77 years old, I don't know anything. The longer I live, the less I know. Because the wealth of information that's out there has overwhelmed my little puny little brain. Yes, that's self-deprivation. -depri but compared to the knowledge of the world, Dave is a peanut. But that peanut's going to work the best I know how to make that peanut work. I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got for the cause I'm called to. And the cause I'm called to is greater than the hour I'm experiencing. Oh, man, I hope I just said that right. I hope you heard it. Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. And obedience is better than sacrifice, but not in lieu of sacrifice. Don't substitute one for the other. Make them inclusive. Give God an obedient sacrifice. How's that? Obedience is better than sacrifice, because sacrifice without being obedient is a waste of good blood. And I came to a conclusion, never let a good scar go to waste. If, you're gonna, if it's going to cost you something, let it be valued at that cost. Whatever you have bought with your suffering, make that suffering pay. I'm going, don't let suffering make you serve it. You, you make the suffering serve you. Make every scar, every pain, everything in your life that came along that was painful, make it bow down and worship you. Because you are master of your destiny when it is under the thumb of the destiny of Christ. In other words, what good is it? How can you possibly follow Christ? without your decision to do it. So submit your authority to his authority, but you have authority to submit it. Does that make sense? If you have a God-given right and will to choose, then use that God-given right and will to choose to choose the right will of God. <laughs> That's the best way I know how to say it. He gave us the right to sin. He gave us the right to curse him to his face. He gave us the right to go to hell itself. He also gave us the right to bend the knee and confess with the mouth that he is the Lord God Almighty and his son Jesus gave himself for us. So I considered value through suffering for many years of my life. It's becoming more and more valuable to me because suffering is something I still have to deal with. Now, I, let me preface what I'm going to say. If you pity me, you're dead wrong. You're as wrong as wrong. You know what the problem with pitying people is? When you pity them, they start to pity themselves. And self-pity is self-destruction. And when I get pity, I despise it, and yet I'm so stupid I accept it. Go figure. That's the man talking to you. That's the clay standing before you. That's the broken man telling you how to be healed as a broken man. I'm not up here because I'm perfect. I'm shattered right now. My self-confidence is at very low esteem. It's the worst it's been, and I don't know when, if ever. Why? Because God's maybe trying to teach me my confidence doesn't need to be in me. It needs to be in him. I, I don't know. I just know I'm not going to stop loving people. I'm not going to stop loving Doug because he doesn't have both legs. He's got one, left, one leg left to stand on. He'd give them both for the cause of Christ because, you see, back to my opening statement, what is a leg worth? What's a face worth? What's suffering worth? What, you know, they, they raided me. I, I've told this 
God bless Beth. She has to hear some of this stuff more than once. You're going to hear it maybe once or twice today. Whenever you get hurt in the military, they compare that against you going into the military at 100% perfection. They're not going to take you with, like the guy that went and had all his teeth pulled out, all his teeth pulled, so they wouldn't draft him. And they turned him down because he had flat feet. That's a true story. That is a tr- I, I heard that on the news by Paul Harvey. He had every tooth pulled because you can't go in the military with false teeth. They don't have dental record. And the only reason they drilled and filled a cavity is because I didn't have one, so they drilled and made one. And then they have a record of my dental experience for my dead body. They didn't fi- fill a, a cavity. They filled a box with a check mark. He had a cavity, and here's the, here's the x-ray. So when they were actually doing my teeth, they were preparing me for my death. That's a morbid thought. I went in the military totally ignorant of what I was doing. No idea. Nobody in my family ever served in the military, ever. I'm going all the way back to Charlemagne, whoever that was. So I like something you drink, not champagne. <laughs> I, I, I don't know my family history that well, but I think I'm the only guy that ever served in the military. Look what happened to me. My children, God forbid, they look at me and say, don't do what Papa did. Probably many of mothers pointed at me and said, "Don't do if you don't drink your milk, you're going to look like Dave Reeder. <laughs> so there's something good out of something bad, and that's what I'm trying to get to. And as I look back over the years, the brokenness that I've had to live with all my life since has never really healed. It never has healed. And I'm of a train of thought right now that never will. Physically, they'll never get me back to normal. They've tried. I've had 62 surgeries. They've got another one coming up next month. They can, if it was 6,200 surgeries, they're never going to get Dave back to normal. Do you understand that? Say amen. They can't do it. And they made me a nose, but still, if you look close, it's still two noses made in one. They made it on top of my head. I don't pick my nose. I mean, I'm scattered all over myself. My eyelids came off the back of my ear. My mouth came off my shoulder. I'm not going to tell you where my face came from. (laughs) My legs, you're safe. But what about that broken man on the inside that I'm trying to get to? Because that's where you you and I relate. You don't relate to my injury. You don't relate to pastor's loss. You, You don't relate to that very well. I mean, I've been down my road and you've been down yours and there's some of your roads I wouldn't go down for the world. Some of you have been hurt worse than I've ever dreamed of being hurt. Half my skin blown off my body. That didn't hurt near as bad as the little girl scream, Mommy, what is it? What is it? Pointing at me. That hurt. So what I'm trying to do is distinguish the body from the soul. How are you doing today? How are you? People don't walk up and say, look at your feet and say, hey, George, they look at your face. And they call you by name according to the image on the front side of your head. Or maybe it's the back side. I've never had to determine that for sure. But they look at your face, not your feet. We're transformed by the renewing of our, of our minds, not our feet. Our mind controls our emotions. Our emotions are expressed through our countenance. The Bible says, thy Countenance doth betray thee. You, I, we read the body language of everybody. You know it, I know it. You can say okay or okay or okay. Three different expressions of two letters of the alphabet that are identical that have absolutely nothing in common in explanation of definition. It's not just English. That's in any language you can find. There are certain words that you can say certain ways. the same word but have different meanings. You read the countenance to discover what do they really mean? What are they really trying to say to me? What am I really trying to say to you? And so whenever you lose that image, that capacity to show the reality, you feel like you're living in a hypocritical life because you, you're not able to show what you really want. So then you rely on emotions, and that's where the soul is separated by the two-edged sword from the body. 
and the soul damage. This is a lesson I've learned and have to teach in resiliency training for the United States military through the Department of Defense. There's three injuries you sustain in life. One, physical. You don't need a lot of explanation about that. Two, emotional. In the military, it's called post-traumatic injury, stress, post-traumatic stress. And then they add the D, disorder. First of all, for insurance, not because you're necessarily disordered, but if you want to get insurance pay, call yourself disordered and be disordered. Pretend you're dizzy all the time and people give you money. That's the way you play the game. That's the way you, that's the way you get what you don't deserve. I know I've been down this road with everybody I deal with. Have to find the truth about them. And finding the truth is that sharp, two-edged sword that cuts. And I want you to hear me, folks. I don't want anything that's not mine. Right now, there's all kinds of accusations against the Democratic Vice President Walls, Democratic Vice President nominee, for stolen valor. I'm going to tell you something. If, I, if valor is so important to me, I have to steal it. I've already lost it. There's no, there is no such thing. The soul has to be, has to be circumcised to get the flesh out, and that is difficult. God spoke to his people in two ways. The old generation through circumcision, very ugly, very nasty, very carnal. In the New Testament, he spoke to them through speaking in other tongues. Very obviously disgusting to hear people talk in tongues. What's that? And some whole denominations say you're going to hell and you're the devil if you do. And yet there's the biblical evidence that if you don't, you're not experiencing the fullness of the gospel. So which, what do you choose? It's up to you. But the fact is, anything that has to do with following Christ is going to include suffering. If you don't eat his flesh, you don't drink his blood, you have no part with him. Am I making myself clear? Brother Dave, we like it better when you make us laugh and tell us your testimony. Don't send me to Vietnam and then ask me to come back all refreshed and be funny because right now there's nothing left in Dave Reaver but the cold stone hard facts. That if we are not willing to suffer with him, we cannot reign with him. So no, I, do, I wouldn't do this again if I knew what was coming. But because I don't know what's coming, my everyday leap of faith requires of me asking forgiveness for my sins before asking to forgive you yours. And as the work of a priest, quote unquote, I'm not against Catholicism, I love Catholics. I'm not against Mormons. I love Mormons. I'm not against different ideas about different things. I love people. But for Dave, I am not your high priest. I can intercede in prayer for you, but I cannot intercede on a cross for your sin. One did, and that cross is vacated. It's empty because he finished what he started. Amen. Amen. And it included an awful lot of suffering. So to conclude, I want to take you back to a riverbank on the border with Vietnam and Cambodia in 1969. Yes, teenager, that's right after the War of 1812. <laughs> I didn't know that day was coming. I knew it could. I was trained to believe it would. Actually, I was trained to believe that I would not come home, and if I did, I'd come home mutilated. We had the highest KIA killed in action per capita, but you can't prove it because when the bodies went down those little fiberglass river boats that we fought on, they don't retrieve your body even though they know you're dead, you're not killed in action, you're missing in action until they get your body. I knew the stats. I knew what it was going to cost. But you never believe it for yourself. It's always somebody else going to get hurt. It's always somebody else. It never happened to you. Well, it happened to me. And I discovered on the bank of that river what suffering is, but I didn't know, didn't know what suffering was for. I knew what it was, but I didn't know why. I didn't know why God couldn't stop a little 7.62 bullet from coming out of the end of an AK-47, passing through the flesh of my right hand and piercing a white phosphorus sand grenade, causing it to explode six inches from my right ear. If he can put the moon in space, couldn't he stop that little bullet? Come on, be honest. Yes, he could have. Why didn't he? Haunted me for years, drove me to the brink of suicide. Literally one effort, one try. I've heard people try it ten times. Well, you, nine of them, you should learn how to do it. I mean, if you're going to try nine out of ten times and fail, just quit trying. Maybe it'll happen accidentally. 
I can't imagine trying to kill myself again and again and again and again. I never tried again. I set up myself for it, and then I realized, I can't do this to my family. I can't do this to my daughter. I can't do this to my son. I can't do this to my wife. But I can do this to myself. I can sin against me before I can sin against them. And one day, I was invited to Trinity Broadcast Network. I'm going to close with this story. I'm not going to keep here all day. How are we doing on time? Oh, man, it's only 1130. I was going to try to go till 12, but midnight's a long way off. I was invited on TV, and I'd been on a 90-day tour. I was exhausted. I didn't want to speak. I didn't want to see people. I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't want to sign another autograph. I just wanted to be left alone. Maybe there's a football game on. Something I can go to sleep watching. And I got a phone call Sunday night. Oh, hi, Brother Dave. This is Jan. I said, I know your voice. I didn't know her hair. It changed daily, but I knew her voice. <laughs> And she said, we need you on TV in tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? I said, she said, it's Memorial Day. I said, I know it's Memorial Day, but you're calling on Sunday night for me to be there tomorrow night. I just came off a 90-day tour. Jan, I can't do that. I'd be a terrible, I'd be a horrible guest. I, I'm too tired. She talked me into it. That's the problem with women. You can live with them. You can't live with them. You can't live without them. You, now, how do you live with women? It's crazy but don't try living without them. I'm going to tell you something. The greatest lesson I would learn in my lifetime may have come because she talked me into it that day. I got there and I said, Miss Jen, I'm tired. Please don't ask me any hard. Back then, TBN covered the face of the earth. Even sinners watched TBN then. I guess they were looking for entertainment. I'm serious. They, they watched TBN to make fun of it. And then a guy like me would come along and make fun of myself. They didn't know how to deal with that. They, they couldn't deal with the fact I found humor in my own suffering because I saw suffering as an avenue, not a curse. She said, I'll make it easy, Brother Dave. I'll, I said, please don't ask any hard questions. Sound like Hillary Clinton did in primaries. <laughs> First question she asked me, is this an easy one? Listen to it. Davey, you still carry baggage out of that war. She's not inquiring about my Samsonite. She's not curious about my traveler suitcase. She's asking me, do you wake up at night jerking hair rollers out of your wife's hair, loading imaginary machine guns? She's asking me, are you suicidal? That's what she's asking me. That's baggage out of war. Did you hear me? Ask any combat vet in this room. They'll tell you exactly what I just said is the truth. And when you're tired, you're vulnerable. When you're vulnerable, you have a tendency to tell the truth. And I'm telling you the truth. I told her stuff I never told my wife. I told her how many times the thought of suicide went through my mind and the one time I actually tried it. And this is her reaction. She dressed her hair. I just talked about trying to kill my stinking self, and she dresses her hair. And I'm thinking, holy cow, she just dressed her hair. When I see a cow, I moo. <laughs> I looked at her and I thought, well, you know why, God, that you be scarred, maimed, and burned, don't you? That's not another easy question. That's the one I didn't know the answer to. I knew he didn't do it. I knew what happened, when it happened, where it happened, but I didn't know why he didn't stop it. Why didn't the guy that loved me? enough to give himself for me, rose from the dead to give himself to me, and why didn't he stop that bullet? See, I was still dealing with the wrong side of the equation. I was thinking, what happened? It doesn't matter what happened. It's how you deal with it. And I wasn't dealing with it. I still don't deal with it. I pigeonhole, I put it back. I try to discourage myself from dealing with it. Just let it alone. Let a sleeping dog lie. Don't kick a sleeping dog. Why? Because I don't want to relive it. I relive it every time I take a mic. There's times I can almost smell my body burn again. And I have. The memory smelled it. And that's when I lay the mic down. I walk out because the next level is to feel the pain again. And I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to feel that pain again. 
This is the guy talking. This is the guy some call a hero. I'm the guy in the ninth grade that quit playing football because it hurt so bad and joined the band and watched other kids get hurt. <laughs> Me. Yeah, that's the bright, intelligent man talking to you. If there's any esteem left in me, it's going to have to be found in Jesus Christ because David doesn't have any. And if that's what it takes to know him, bring it on. That I may know him in the fullness, in the fullness of himself who loved me enough to die for me. You know why God let you be scarred, maimed, and burned, don't you? And I'm thinking, no, but this blue-haired wonder is going to explain it to me. I was so mad at her, I could have pinched her head off, but it wasn't the Jerry Springer show. So I tried to be a gentleman. I did. I tried to be a gentleman. I like to be a gentleman even when I'm totally hacked off about the whole, the world in general. I try to be a gentleman. It's no Miss Jan. I don't guess I know why God let me be scarred, maimed, and burned. <laughs> That's what I want to say. I didn't say it that way. Listen to her answer. And you tell me, is this wisdom from God? Davy, Jesus didn't shoot you that day. And he didn't stop it from happening. And that is the issue. Why didn't he stop it? She's about to answer the question, change the trajectory of my life, and I'm sitting there totally unprepared for what she said next. He didn't do it, but he didn't stop it because. And the word because is like it's the fulcrum my life would balance on. Would I continue down the road seeking a way to take my life, to end it, to finish this thing once and for all, let my kids get old enough to understand why daddy killed himself? Would that work? Listen to her answer. He didn't stop it from happening because he knew, he knew. He could trust you with the scars. Are you listening to me? What has he trusted you with? And you're shaking your fist in his face saying, why me, God? What has he trusted us with? Because he believed in us. and We don't trust him because we don't believe in him. Someone said, with every child born, it's proof God has not given up on the human race. I say, with every child aborted, it's proven we have. God is still God, and we're still us. And the more we know about him, we learn through suffering, not through party time. You can praise and worship till you're blue in the face and drop over dead from exhaustion. But if you've never suffered for something, you will never know the value of it. Because suffering puts a price tag on it. And until you know what it costs you to obtain it, you'll never, ever appreciate it. Worship, it's the value of our relationship with Christ. It absolutely is irreplaceable. There's nothing going to replace worship. And there's nothing that can teach you better than suffering. No. Don't go stand in front of a city bus to get hurt. Don't look for suffering. Suffering's out there looking for you. When he comes, embrace it and say, God, what lesson do I learn from this one? Lately, I've learned there's a few lessons I still got to learn. And I hope to God I learn them. Because I'm in the same boat you're in. It's a little foolish for us to be saying to each other, bail water, you're into the boat sinking. If we don't all bail water, we all go down together. Let's bail water, amen? amen. So the final question is, what are you willing to die for? What, is will, what are you willing to suffer for? It will reduce for you, suffering will reduce for you, the value of the content of life. You discover what you would do and what you would not do. You would lose and never get back. And if you could, what would you pay to get it back? You see, when there's nothing left to lose, you're the most dangerous person to the devil you'll ever be. You've got nothing to lose. Why? Because you already gave your heart away. You can give away a leg. You can give away a face. You can give away your wrist. You can give away your fingers. Give away your body. 
and the board of direct, uh, the medical board of the military can call you 100% permanently totally disabled like they did me. Yet I'm holding a mic with a ter permanently disabled hand speaking an eternal truth. I have a job. I am not disabled. Don't let the world identify you and don't let them identify me. Be what God called you to be. Learn through suffering. Grow in worship and praise and do all the stuff that we're supposed to do. But don't blame God for our own mistakes. And when we do make mistakes, learn from them. Don't let a good scar go to waste. That's my message and I'm sticking to it. I love you. Can I pray? We have, we have time for a quick prayer. Uh, he didn't tell me when to quit, but he did say the platform would open up my drop into hell. It, it, no. Uh, we have time for a quick prayer? All right. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. One of the best lessons I've ever learned in my life, I learned a couple weeks ago from our hero, our pastor, our friend Doug. And that is, when it hurts, you don't quit. You just don't quit. First of all, sometimes you say, I'll quit, but where are you when you say it? It's probably not good to quit if you're halfway down from an airplane in a parachute. You don't want to quit then. So hang on to the end, amen? Hold on. Hold on. The other thing I want to reemphasize is give your heart to Christ because then after that, everything else is equalized. All the tops of the spikes are cut off. Life becomes more normal without the spikes, amen? The spikes are disgusting. And so today, whenever I ask you to follow me in a prayer, I got to sort of blow my nose on up here. No notes, just nose. I'm not going to pray a pre-can prayer here. I want the Spirit of God to lead this prayer. I'm going to help lead you. And here's the condition to make this prayer work. If you pray this prayer, you heard it before you said it, you're responsible for it if you repeat it. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are Lord. You are Jesus. You are Lord Jesus Christ. You're above all. You love all. And you're anointed above all. The Savior of your people. Not just a Jewish nation. You died for the Gentile. Just as much. You died for me as much as you did for Paul and Peter. Who, by the way, Lord... Died for you too. I ask you, give us a sense of urgency. The world is disgusted with hypocrisy. They don't know up from down, left from right. They don't know truth from a lie anymore. Let them look at our lives and see the balance of truth. For once in their lifetime, they can look at somebody and say, I know they're right. Make us right. Not for the egotistical bragging rights, but make us right in our lifestyle. Let our words and our actions be equitable. Teach us your ways, God. Jesus, forgive us of all of our sins. While I may be a vicarious gift as a speaker at a podium, I am no greater than the priest of his home who stands in this congregation today. The esteem and the right of leadership is bestowed upon him by you. Regardless of the political climate of wokeism today, Let men be men. Let women be women. And let people know the difference. And God, I pray that the children in this world of confusion 
will first find truth and anchor in righteousness in the home before they ever even get to the church. Make us what we ought to be. Turn our hearts to you. Turn the Father's heart to the Son. The Son to the Father. Mother to the daughter. Daughter to the mother. Daughter to her dad. Son to his mom. Let our hearts be blended together in an unknown unity today. God, heal our nation. Heal our families. Heal our brokenness. In Jesus' name, heal us that we might be a healer to others. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if at any point in this message, you've, through circumspect, you've been looked at your, you've looked inside yourself, and you've asked yourself the question, am I who I say I am? Am I am what I say I am? And you have not found that answer. I urge you strongly, don't walk out these doors until you've answered that question. Good, bad, or ugly, you need to find out exactly where, because if you don't know where you are, how do you know where you're going? There's no song, don't let the circle be unbroken. Wouldn't it be absolutely, incredibly, incredulously wonderful to believe that not one soul in this room would be left standing here if that trumpet sounded right now? What a thought. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. I'm going to go back to that table, and I'm going to sign some books if that will help draw you there because I really do need you to buy a book. I know you're going to give in an offering. After this message, you might want to take money from the church instead of giving it. <laughs> I'm not going to water it down. See, I don't want your blood on my hands. We have to make tough decisions in life, don't we? All of us. We all have to make tough decisions. I made some tough ones this week. Very, very difficult. But my confidence is in the Lord. And I pray that I can bring hope to the Border Patrol. I was there when they were accused of whipping Haitians. That was a lie out of hell and out of Washington, D.C. And sometimes I can't tell the difference. I'm not going to let those men and women that are serving our country, because if we lose that last line... Our first line of defense is overseas. Our second line of defense, if you want to call it that, is our first responders, our first line. Boy, our last line of defense. It's our borders. And we don't know what's come across already, much less what's yet to come. Pray for your border patrol. Amen. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. I thought I would. Pray that I'll have the right words for them. Pray that they'll... Hear and receive. It's one thing to hear. It's another thing to listen. A lot of people hear. They don't listen. Let's be attentive to listen. I love you, church. I came a long ways to be with you today. I guarantee you, nobody went further to church today at CT than I did. <laughs> My wife and I crossed the limits of, of time and space. We went through so many time zones. My watch got confused. But... It's been a joy to be back. Thanks for letting me have a safe place to speak my heart. I'm safe here. Amen. You may be seated for just a few moments. If we could have the ushers come forward. We want to receive a love offering for... This goes to the ministry. This, this offering, as Dave said, does not go to him. It goes to Reaver's ministry. And there is so much going on around the world. You know, they're ministering to wounded warriors here in the States, uh, to even the wives of our warriors they have conferences for. And uh, never does anyone pay a dime to come to any of these conferences. They fly them in free of charge. They minister to them. 
uh, without charging, uh, literally without charging anything to these people. And these conferences are ongoing. And he has a, a Bible school in Vietnam, the very country where he almost lost his life. They have a Bible school with a couple hundred, uh, a couple thousand 280,000 students, Bible students in the country of Vietnam. And, uh, you know, they provide all the funding for this. So I, I hope uh, you've opened your ears to hear the Lord say, how can I be generous to Dave Reaver Ministries this morning? You can uh, write a check. You can put cash in the army. You can use the app. Uh, the, and there is a Reaver Ministries line right on our app. So uh, that might be the best way to do it because then... So he, they have a conference coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks at the Texas Ranch that is, has about a thirty thousand dollar budget, and uh, we, they need help with that. So if you put that on a credit card, uh, he can get you a receipt for your tax deductible giving. So. Yeah, and he'll give us a full report. So uh, you don't have to worry about Dave being on the up and up. He is a, a man of his word and a man of integrity. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning uh, for the joy and, and just the uh, uh, blessing of having Dave and Beth in service with us, Lord God, thank you for this powerful word that he shared with us. Lord, let us be uh, a generous blessing to them and this ministry that is ongoing around the world, Lord God. Uh, we, it, we count it a privilege to be used uh, in this ministry, Lord God. And I just pray you bless each gift and giver this morning. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. So stand with us this morning, stop and see Dave back at the table, help them out. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious Sunday morning that you've given us to come into your house of worship, Lord, to worship you, to hear your word. Lord, as we leave today, help us to be the witnesses that you've called us to be, Lord, that we can help further the kingdom of God just by the way we live our lives and the example that we can be in this world, Lord, as doors of opportunity open for us to, uh, to share your love to share your word and to be a witness for you. Let us always uh, be willing to uh, walk through those doors and take a hold of those opportunities, Lord, that people will see your love living in us and through us. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and all God's people said, amen, amen. Great to see you all at Calvary Temple this morning. <laughs> 